in Newgrange. I haven't been here since the spring equinox uh, in 2007. We're also going to see Nelth, which I couldn't even make it to last time, so I'm quite excited. Let's uh, be Anthony Murphy and check out these amazing sights in the Boyne Valley. There's a, there's a big sort of um, fascination at Newgrange and the monuments here with not only with the sun but also with the moon as some of the planets and the stars and the Milky Way because Bruna Bonia actually means the mansion or the womb of Boan and Boan was the goddess who who the river is named after the Boyne River comes from Boan which is Bowfin which is the white cow or the illuminated cow and interestingly, the Irish name for the Milky Way is Balloch na Bofinna, the way of the white cow. And the river is the river of the white cow. So what you begin to see is a sort of a, a cosmic, um, uh, the idea of a, a cosmic vision here that saw what was on the ground as being a reflection of what was in the sky. Uh, Angus, who came to own the Newgrange, the original gods were called the Tuatha Dé and the original owner of Newgrange was the Dagda, he was the chief god, but his son Angus tricked him out of it. He said he wanted it for a night and a day, and his father said, okay, you can have it for a night and a day, and the next day he came to take it back, and Angus said, of all time, night and day is made. He basically, you know, night and day is eternity, as far as Angus was concerned, so the Dagda relinquished control of Newgrange to Angus, but Angus came Angus had a dream at Newgrange of uh, a beautiful maiden in his dreams and he became sick with love for her and he wanted to meet this woman of his dreams and eventually she was found in the form of a swan in Tipperary and the legend says that in order to become lovers he had to take the form of a swan and of significance to that is the fact that Newgrange is a very significant wintering ground for the whooper swan the whooper swans come to Ice, from Iceland to Ireland in October in huge numbers and congregate at Newgrange for the winter from October to about March in very large numbers. So much so that Newgrange is a, a officially designated a, 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 an important wintering ground for the whooper swan. And I wonder whether perhaps the whooper swan has actually been coming here since prehistory. The fact that there's significant swan mythology here um, points to maybe, and the fact that the chamber represents this cross-shaped constellation. But of even greater interest is, I think you were at Fornox, was it yesterday or the day before? Newgrange, if you follow the axis of the passageway, it actually points to Fornox. And Fornox in turn points to the place where Deneb, the bright star of Cygnus, was rising off the horizon in the Neolithic. And the reason Cygnus was important in, at that particular time was because it's circumpolar for the rest of precession, and precession is a 26,000 year cycle. And all the time, except for this one century, around the time Newgrange was built, Deneb and Cygnus are circumpolar, they're visible throughout the night. And at this one epoch in history, Deneb sort of settles along the northern horizon and disappears for a short time and then rises again. And the place where it rises, that's where Fornox points to. And Fornox, of course, again has, Fornox has two elements which I think are very interesting. One is the cross, because you'll notice that it has a similar design to Newgrange in that it's got, you know, the three recesses. But the other is the egg. So you've got the cross and the egg, which are both together at Fornox. But another thing that's significant about, and you've seen it very well described in there or uh, shown to you, is the ability of the aperture of the roof box of Newgrange to filter out any stray light coming into the chamber. You notice when she turned off the lights, it was pitch dark. Like they didn't close any doors. Like the light is still coming in. 
And I think the reason it did that was because at the time Newgrange was built, Sirius, the brightest star in the sky, was also rising and visible from the chamber of Newgrange. I think that they probably used Sirius as some sort of a processional device. They were able to see how precession slowly shifts the positions of stars. And within a few centuries of Newgrange being built, Sirius wasn't shining in anymore. But, but also then the morning star, there's a folk tale recorded by Joseph Campbell in the 1950s that said that once every eight years the morning star shines into Newgrange and nobody seemed to pay any attention to this until um, uh, Christopher Knight and Robert Lomas wrote Uriel's Machine and they speculate that the eight cross-shaped symbols on the on the uh, lintel stone of the roof box might represent the eight years of the Venus cycle but in actual fact the folklore is astronomically accurate in that on one uh, year out of every eight, before the dawn of winter solstice, Venus will rise over Red Mountain and will be visible from the chamber of Newgrange. Now, nobody has actually set out to view that because it's still not sort of accepted as part of the function of the site. But astronomically, it's 100%. It's, it's exactly what happens, and there's no arguing with it. I think that part of the reason the aperture does that um, remove stray light is that so that these slightly dimmer objects can be seen by an observer in the chamber. Curiously, in 1958, when Campbell wrote his book, uh, Primitive Mythology, The Mask of the Gods, um, and recorded this tale, that couldn't have been visible because you have to understand over the centuries there was a gradual settlement of the cairn and the passage and chamber. What happened was basically, yeah, the, the, the orthostats leaned inwards and as a result the roof slabs came down and basically blocked the light from coming in. So when O'Kelly started excavating Newgrange he couldn't have seen the sunlight coming in on the solstice, he couldn't have seen that because it was blocked off. It was only when he reconstructed, they took off some of the roof slabs, they raised the orthostats, they put the roof slabs back on, and the whole thing was higher by a number of inches. And that's what allowed the light to come in. So we had a folk tale that records an astronomical event that happens here that couldn't have been visible when the folk tale was recorded. And of course the question is, and it's only speculation on my part, I think it's an original function of the monument. Of course I do, but um, other people mightn't be convinced. But the axis of the site is defined by these vertical lines on this curb stone and on the curb stone and in the front as if I don't know as if there were some sort of a, 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 a the idea of a sacred axis um, which obviously follows the alignment of the site so if you're standing uh, or sitting at this stone uh, on the summer solstice the sun sets directly in line with this stone so you because the su winter sunrise and summer sunset are exactly opposite each other they're, invest they're still investigating whether there's another passage in here and I believe that that's not definitively. There was a work done here before which seemed to indicate that there isn't a passageway here but I think the jury is still out as to whether there's still that possibility. As I said, um, oh, Professor O'Kelly didn't actually excavate the whole monument, this is Sirius, directly on the axis of the site because when it was built Sirius was visible from the chamber but uh, only after a couple of centuries because of procession Sirius is would no longer have been visible from the chamber. Oh, more, more to come. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But the Fornox alignment, if you, just, if you actually, that's a solstice alignment. Fornox is 15 miles that way. And if you stretch that line backwards, um, there's a, a very large, there's a mound and an enclosure on a hill about, I don't know, six or seven miles that way. And then a further uh, hill with a cluster of barrows on it, about 40 barrows. And they're all directly on this alignment. Yeah, I mean, precisely. You can, one of the great things about Google Earth now is that you can draw these lines yeah. through monuments and see how stunningly accurate it is. Um, and then that raises all sorts of questions. If there were aligning sites, and remember that Fornox can't be seen from here because it's, you know, Red Mountain is in the way, you can't actually see Fornox. If they were able to do that, how did they do it? This is an incredible site. It's one of the most impressive sites in the world. This aligns with Fornox. Uh, this actually points to Fornox, which uh, I find completely fascinating. But it also connects with Giza. We know that there is an alignment between Newgrange and Giza, which is one tenth of the planetary circumference. 
So I find that particularly interesting. But it's also the fact that this whole Boyne Valley area is just scattered with mounds, megaliths, stone circles, and new discoveries are currently being made with LIDAR, uh, like they're doing in Ohio. So a whole new range of sites are coming forth. So let's wait and see what happens with those. Thank you.